Well, good evening to you all. Let's start our meeting with hymn number 773. 773. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing what it was for me he died on Calvary. <coughs> Years I spent in vanity and pride, Caring not my Lord was crucified, Knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was 
great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdens of and liberty at Calvary. <clears throat> By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the Lord I spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. Then my burden shall come liberty at Calvary. Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. situation we're in and some very bad things and filthy things have been done in, by those people in the leadership of our land and we pray that you might intervene in that and then we think Lord of the warnings about food supply and people having to pay much more money for their food and we ask that you would undertake we thank you that by your grace we have spent all our lives enjoying a good standard of living. We pray it might continue to be so without us taking it for granted. And then, Lord, as we think further afield, we think of the war in Ukraine. What a terrible business. Seems to be no end to it. But we pray that you'll bring it to an end very soon and deal with those responsible. And then we think of America and the usual number of people shot what a way to live what a world we live in we thank you for our safekeeping 
We thank you for blessing us and keeping us going. Be with us here tonight, Lord. Bless us through your word. Help us, Lord, to give us the best we can to listen to what you've got to say and receive your good in return. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Two readings tonight, once from the end of the Bible, the other one's from the beginning of the Bible. So we'll start with the book of Revelation in chapter 12. Sorry, it's um, Revelation chapter 22. So we're going right to the end of the Bible. And I'm reading from verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there should be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb should be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the saying of the prophecies of the And then Genesis in chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8. And the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord grow, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. <coughs> the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted, and he came into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there's gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is Bedelium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidikel. That is it which goeth towards the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So last week we saw that when God had made the universe, he rested on the seventh day and sanctified it. He set men and women an example that they should rest one day in seven and keep that day holy for the Lord. And God saw that all that he'd made was very good, which proves there was no death at that time. There was no predatory system among the animals. 
Verse 7 of chapter 2 tells us that God formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed life into him. He also gave him a spiritual dimension. He gave man a soul which is eternal. Having made man, the Lord now made a garden for him to live in. For though the whole world at this time was a lovely place, the Lord made man a special place to live in, and he called it the Garden of Eden. And that word Eden means delight. It must have been a very wonderful place indeed. It said in verse 8 that the Lord planted this garden, showing that it was especially designed to be the very best for man. The Lord intended that Adam would be very happy and was working all things together for his good. It said in verse 9 that God made to grow every tree that was pleasant to the sight and good for food. And these beautiful trees were already laden with delicious fruit for man to eat, remembering at this time man only ate fruit. Even today, whereas most other foods are said by some person or other to cause this problem or that illness, fruit is recommended by almost everybody. These things point us back to the original plan of God for man and show that in the Garden of Eden things couldn't have been better. And everything there was, was uh, all fresh, all new, and that's pictured by the fact that the garden was eastward in Eden. You see, the sun rises in the east, the new day therefore begins in the east, and it shows that man received this garden of Eden when it was at its very best. The main truth in these verses tonight is that God was very good to man. He gave him the very best. And man must have seen that all God's thoughts towards him were in love. And yet later on we shall see how that Adam disobeyed God. He was not content, content with God's perfect provision. Despite all that he'd been given, he was dissatisfied and went against his maker. And this proves forever that people do not sin because of their troubles. They do not become criminals because of their environment. They do not steal because they're desperately hard up. And yet this is what we're always being told that people, if they were better provided for, they would live more honest lives. But that's not true. The fact is that people are bad within, and no matter how well off they are, they're often dishonest. You see, Adam was well provided for, but he turned bad. He had everything that he wanted, but he never knew when he was well off, like so many people today. These verses teach clearly that dis discontentment with your lot in life rarely comes through a lack of blessing or through trouble. For Adam had no troubles at this time, and he was greatly favoured, but he still went bad. And it's still the same today, that if certain people were a lot better off than they are, they'd still be dissatisfied because of the covetousness of their hearts. Now verse 9 also tells us that amongst all the other trees, God planted two trees which were especially important. One was the tree of life, and the other was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We're specifically told that the tree of life was planted in the midst of the garden. So there it was, right in the centre of the garden. And the wonderful thing about this tree was that its fruit would make man live forever, if taken on a regular basis. It was a tree of life. In fact, even after Adam's sin, if he'd been able to eat this special fruit, he would never have died. For that's why God later put him out of the garden Eden. We see that in the next chapter. Now the last chapter of the Bible, which we read together, tells us about the paradise to come. And indeed, these verses here in Genesis are a picture of what heaven will be like because the paradise that Adam lost through his sin will be gained by those who are forgiven for their sins through Jesus Christ. Revelation also tells us that in heaven there will be lots of lovely fruit trees just like in the Garden of Eden. And we can expect to see tame animals there just like there was in the Garden of Eden. We're also told that this tree of life will be in heaven and that Christians will feast upon it 
and live forever. And it is the fruit of this particular tree that will stop people growing old in heaven. It's the land where you never grow old. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now the other tree was of great importance as well, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For this was the tree that was forbidden for man to eat, but from which Eve later took the fruit that caused all the trouble. She saw the fruit of this tree that it was good for food and pleasant to the eyes, but it was forbidden to them by God, and therefore they were better off without it if only they had realised it. Because the fruit of this tree gave them the knowledge of good and evil. And so when later Adam and Eve ate it, that's what they received. They'd never known evil before, but now they did. In fact, they would experience the effect of evil upon their lives from now on. They also came to realise what was good. For although they had the experience of a great deal of good in their lives up till now, they never appreciated it until it was taken away from them. If you've got good health and you've had it all your life, you don't realise it. It's only when you get bad health that you see the, the knowledge of good health. The only people who pray about their lungs are those who've got something wrong with their lungs. The others don't have the knowledge of good and evil lungs. And because Adam and Eve had never received anything bad, they didn't have the knowledge of that which was good. Now just like the tree of life had its counterpart in the New Testament, so does the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because that pictures the cross of the Lord Jesus, which is described as a tree more than once. Peter says, Who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree. The cross was made of wood from a tree and called the tree for that reason. John's Gospel tells us that Christ was crucified in a garden. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of Christ's cross was both planted in a garden. And it's all shown that what man lost through sin was restored to him through Christ. And the paradise that was lost is now regained through our Saviour. The cross is also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the sense that nowhere else in the whole of scripture or throughout the history of the world do we see so much good and so much evil at one and the same time. We see the goodness of God and the love of Christ as the Saviour poured out his blood for sinners, and yet we see the evil of man as he murdered the only perfect person who ever lived. Just think of that, only one person who ever perfect and he was murdered. The total depravity of men and women is seen as never before. So if you want the knowledge of good and evil, then look to the tree on which Christ was crucified. And that tree is also pleasant to the eyes, as was the former one, in the sense that the eye of faith is greatly blessed with a view of the cross, because we see our sins blotted out there. As the hymn puts it, Near the cross, O Lamb of God, Bring its scenes before me, help me walk from day to day with its shadow o'er me. A lot of the worldliness and backsliding and unhappiness that is sometimes within Christians comes about because they've drifted away from the cross. We all need a fresh view of Christ hanging on the tree in order to help us live out our lives with both happiness and holiness. Now getting back to the Garden of Eden, we find in verse 10 that a river flowed through it in order to water it. The garden was so luscious that it would need an abundant supply of water. The river would also add to its beauty. Most people enjoy walking along the bank of a river. And again we're told in Revelation that there will be a river running through heaven for our delight. We know from the first psalm that trees are better off being planted by a river. And so it was with the trees of paradise. As there was no rain as yet, the river must have been derived from some sort of underground spring. It must have been a very large river, for we're told that after it passed through the Garden of Eden, 
it's split up into four heads or four parts, each of which became a river on its own. And these four rivers are actually named for us in verses 11 to 14. The Pison, the Gion, the Hidical, and the Euphrates. The Hidical is thought to be the river Tigris, and the Euphrates, we know well, it's one of the most famous rivers of history. But the other two rivers we can't be sure about. In fact, they may have disappeared after the Great Flood. The river Pison is said to compass the whole land of Havilah. But where that was is also uncertain. And the Gaian is said to encompass the whole land of Ethiopia. <coughs> this is that some people have believed that this river must be the river Nile. It was certainly an African river, but no river actually encompasses the land of Ethiopia. However, notice that the land of Ethiopia is the first known country that is mentioned in the Bible. And it's obviously of some significance because it's mentioned so many times in Scripture. The Hidical is spoken of as running east of Assyria, whereas the Tigris was on the west side of Assyria, so that may prove that the Hidical was not the Tigris. But it all suggests that the geography of today's world, particularly the water, is quite different to the geography of the world before the flood especially regarding the rivers, which would be obvious. <clears throat> this is borne out in the New Testament, where 2 Peter says, By the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. So the whole surface of the world changed after the flood. So it seems improbable that anybody could say whereabouts the garden was. Many people have placed it in the area where the Euphrates and the Tigris meet. As you can see, that's rather unlikely. Certainly the Garden of Eden itself was destroyed by the flood. Verse 11 tells us about gold being found in Haribar, and verse 12 tells us it was good gold. And there was also Bedellium and Onyx stone as well. Bedellium was a precious gum which used to be made into perfume and so on. It's interesting that gold is spoken about at the beginning of history, for it's always been seen as a thing of great value, and still today it's the one thing that holds its own value when money is devalued. The Jews have always had a special interest in gold ever since they made the golden calf, and even today Jews put more, much store by gold. Even some of their surnames has got the word gold in it. Certainly the fact that gold is seen here at the beginning shows that it's something which will never become a thing of no value. And gold was one of the three gifts which the wise men gave to the infant Christ. It paid for his flight into Egypt to protect him from the wicked king Herod. And so God made a garden for man that was not only beautiful and luscious, but it would seem rich. He had everything he could want to make him happy. God even gave him gold and precious stones. But these words about gold may also be showing us the difference between Havilah and the Garden of Eden. For whereas Havilah had got gold and spices and precious stones, Eden had that which was infinitely better, the tree of life and communion with God. And so it is today that people often have to choose between gold and the gospel between the best things of earth and the best things of heaven. Now in, our, in the New Testament, our Lord taught, to whom much is given, much will be required. And so it was with man at the beginning. He'd been given much. He'd been given the Garden of Eden and every blessing that his heart could wish. And therefore much would be required of him. And the main thing that was required of man was that he would accept God's authority over him and obey God's instructions. And because of this, it was necessary to set man a simple test. He was not to, he was not to do one particular thing, a thing which he didn't need to do, just to see whether he could be obedient and show his thankfulness to God for all that he'd been given. If you look at people today, they don't have as much as Adam. 
They don't have a wonderful environment to live in. But many do still have a, a lot. Certainly in Britain today, a lot of people enjoy a high standard of living, although many would argue against that. But the fact is that most people wear fairly new clothes, they eat good food, they drive motor cars, they go on expensive holidays, they have all sorts of domestic gadgets, they get good medical treatment when they're ill, they have a constant supply of water to their homes, and they have 101 luxuries besides. But to whom much is given, much will be required. And therefore the question is, how thankful to God are people today? Do they accept his authority? Do they obey his instructions? And the answer is no. All they do is to find fault with God. They say that he hasn't treated them well. They're not well off. Some even deny his existence altogether. But to whom much is given, much will be required. And people will one day have to ask for all they have taken from God without saying thank you. God's greatest gift to men and women was the gift of his own son. But people are less thankful for him than for anything else. People want to take, take all the time and give nothing back. They want to live a life of sin and not a life for Jesus Christ. It's not so much that people hate them, they're just not interested in God. They just don't want anything to do with him. They don't love him. And this is where we come back to man's original sin. You see, God loved the man that he'd made. But would his love be requited? Would man love him in return? For this is why God made man, so that he would love him. And that's why our Lord Jesus taught later on that the first commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. That's the number one requirement of men and women. And if that's true about us, then we can say, without patting ourselves on the back, that we've lived a successful life. If we love God, we're living the right sort of life. And that's why God put us in this world. And that's why there's so much in the Old Testament about idolatry. God wanted his people to love him and not to love false gods. God is love. He loves men and women. He wants them to love them in, re in response. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved God. But you can't make people love somebody. Love is a voluntary thing. God could have made men and women as robots, unable to choose and unable to love. But God made men and women with a will of their own capable of showing love or not showing love, and thereby the Lord would know when somebody genuinely loved them. There are not many people in this world who genuinely love God, but at least he knows those that do, and he knows that they love him voluntarily and quite freely. There's always been such things as arranged marriages, or marriages of convenience, Two people getting married, not because they love each other, but often for material gain or security. But even people who get married through desperation, they don't, they don't want to be left on their own. They don't really love the person, but they're frightened of being left on their own. But the best marriages are when people marry for love. And that's how it is with God. He doesn't want people to just look to him as the one who can help them with their problems, and protect them from danger and heal them when they're sick. He wants people to love him just for himself. And that's why he set Adam a test at the beginning to find out if he really loved him or not. And so verses 15 to 17 show us God's original commandment to man. First of all, he put man into the Garden of Eden with instructions that he must dress it and keep it. There were no weeds there, but the growth had to be controlled. But we should notice that man did have to work, and the work did not come as a result of sin. Work was given to man before he sinned. Work is good for people, and Adam's work was not wearisome but enjoyable and fulfilling. 
The ideal world is not one of laziness and of wasting your time away and going on cruises throughout the world and so on. It's one of serious activity and usefulness. The only thing that is recorded of Christ that he said in the first 30 years of his life was when he was 14 years old. Sorry, 12 years old. And that was that he must be about his father's business. As a little boy of 12. He must be about his father's business. <clears throat> so even as a boy, he wanted to work. And it shows that Christians must put their best into their employment. And again, it will be the same regarding heaven. Heaven is not a place where people will be hanging around doing nothing all day. There will be enjoyable activity taking place, and we should be serving God. In verse 16, before God gives Adam his most solemn charge, he reminds him of how generous he'd been to him. Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, he could have as much as he wanted from all the trees which God had given him. He was not restricted for quantity or quality. He was even allowed to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. But just one small restraint was put on him, and that only to test his love. For of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. If you do, you're going to die. Now, to say the least, that was a good bargain. All the other trees belonged to man, and just one tree belonged to God. And you would have thought that Adam would have been overcome with such a great offer. But as we saw last week, it's the same today. God says to people, you can have six days in the week, and I'll just have one. That's a very fair offer. But man says, no, I want God's day as well. And that's what Adam said in the end. I want God's tree as well as my trees. All the other trees are not sufficient for me. And as Adam was the first man and the representative of all the people who would descend from it in the future, his great sin in not being content with all that he'd been given and wanting the one thing that had been forbidden him is now part of our fallen human nature and can be seen in all sorts of things, in all sorts of people. King Ahab had many different vineyards which he should have been contented with, but he wanted Naboth's vineyard that had been forbidden him. And so overcome was he that, that he ended up killing Naboth to get his vineyard. It was the same with David. He'd got many wives, but he wanted a wife of Uriah. Instead of being content with all the other wives he'd got, he wanted the one that had been forbidden him. And again, that ended up in the murder of Uriah. And if you and I were completely honest, we can see the same sort of thing can be in our own lives, where we've been given so many good things, so many blessings, so many benefits, and yet perhaps there's something within us that's hankering after the one thing that's been forbidden us. If Adam had have loved God as he ought to have done, there was every reason for him to accept God's requirements. But to disobey God's command would leave him without any excuse, for it was all a test to see if man loved God or not. And you know that test is still with us today. A person's love for God will show itself by the life they lead. Our Lord put it very plainly. <laughs> if you love me, keep my commandments. So those who go against his commandments show they don't love him. Adam should have obeyed good God for two reasons. Firstly, through thankfulness for all God's kindness. And secondly, because of God's warning that he would die if he, if he ate the forbidden fruit. If he kept God's command and kept away from the forbidden fruit, he would live forever. But if he disobeyed God's command and ate the forbidden fruit, he would eventually die. And that warning continues throughout the history of mankind. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. But the gospel goes on to say that the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. But the gospel is not only good news, it's a warning, a 
and most people don't heed the warning and so they die eternally. And nobody can say that they're different to Adam, for we all have the same nature as he had. All Adam's descendants have made the same selfish choice that he made to disobey God. Indeed, before somebody is converted to Christ, they live their whole life in disobedience to God. But Christ came into this world to save sinners. And ever since, Christians have been preaching the gospel. And how thankful we are that there is a gospel to tell. And that men and women can be forgiven for their disobedience. And can be cleansed and saved and reconciled to God. Now how has this happened to each one of us here tonight? The fact that we're at a Bible study midweek suggests that we are true Christian people. But you can't be sure. You see, we have to admit that we have disobeyed God at times. We've done that which he has forbidden. We've all shown at different times in our life that we've not always loved God. Why is it people don't want to get right with God? It's because they don't want to keep God's commandments. They don't want to live the Christian life. They don't want to change the way they're living. Well, may God make us all content so that we appreciate our many blessings. Let us keep ourselves away from that which is forbidden. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Second here is number six hundred. What various hindrances we meet in coming to the mercy seat? Yet who that knows the worth of prayer but wishes to be often there? Amen. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus' name.